We're uh, up to about the 10th chap 10th verse in the first chapter of First Peter. And uh, a 30-second recap of four weeks is this. Peter is talking to Christians, not brand new Christians, but first generation Christians. And he's, he's, he's referring to them as aliens or pilgrims or sojourners or travelers because he wants them, us, to understand that as people of the new birth that comes from baptism, which makes us Christians, which makes us part of the family of God, which makes us part of the church, all the same thing, we are to consider ourselves different from what we were before in a radical way, in such a way that the way we look at ourselves, the way we view our life in this world, the way we look at our future destiny, what we're living for, what we're working for, what we, where we put our heart, our deepest treasure, should be all different. Because as he says in so many places, this new birth has given us a heritage now that's in heaven where it can never be spoiled or soiled or fade away, kept safe by God's power, he says, until the salvation which has been prepared is revealed at the final point of time. He says, this is a great joy to you in verse Six. Even though for a short time we must bear all sorts of trials. It's still a great joy. He's not saying, well, you now are not bulletproof to the difficulties of this world. But they should have a different effect in both ways. If you think about it, if I'm not living for what this world can provide, that kind of should insulate me a little bit from the vice of greed or covetedness. Because the amount of effort and compromise and virtue that I'm willing to, to, to sacrifice to achieve earthly things which now have a lesser value to me should be easier to overcome because I hold those with a looser grip. Not that I don't still want to work for success or financial freedom or friends or whatever. Those are all good things, but still they're not the ultimate goal of why I'm living. And at the same time, the defeats that happen, I lose a job, or I lose my money, or I lose my health, all those things do not ruin me because they ultimately are not my highest goal. He's saying your highest goal is now kept safe for you where it cannot get sick or be stolen or lost by mistake or thieves or an economic bust or any of those other things that can happen in the earthly realm. So it should, our feet are on earth, but our mind should be in heaven. And it should make a difference on how we do our lives, he's saying. Okay, that's the theme of this whole epistle. And he says, and, and as far as the trials that we go through, the sufferings that go through, he says, we have joy even in them because through them the worth of our faith is tested. In other words, we can say, I have faith. I have this other mindedness. I have this heavenly vision, but when I go through trials, it will test and prove how honestly devoted to that I really am. And he says, and if you go through trials, even though you suffer, with a joy, with a hope that is not quenched by those difficulties, your faith will be proved like gold that has been tested in fire. Right? And that God will consider that more valuable even than gold. He says that. So that the worth of your faith, more valuable than gold, which is perishable, even if it has been tested by fire, may be proved to, you pra to your praise and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The last line, verse 9, you are sure of the goal of your faith, that is the salvation of your souls. Okay? So that's where we are so far. He has a few more things to say about this goal, this treasure, this gift which is ours. And then in the middle of chapter 2, he's going to get into a more practical application Answering the question then, how, how then does that look when I apply it to the situation of my real life? And he's going to talk about then, what then is our relationship to civil government? What then is the relationship to a servant, to a master, who's a Christian who serves a non-Christian master? Or a wife, a Christian wife, who maybe is married to a non-Christian husband? Those kind of real life applications. He's going to get to that, but he's not do done talking about this general 
attitude, which he says is more real than anything else we thought was real before, and he's just trying to plant it that deep down in us. He makes this point in verse 10. This salvation was the subject of the search and the investigation of the prophets who spoke of the grace you were to and now have received. Searching out the time and the circumstances for which the Spirit of Christ, bearing witness in them, was revealing the sufferings of Christ and the glories to them, the glories to follow them. We'll go a little bit further, then we'll come back. It was revealed to them that it was for your sake and not their own that they were acting as servants delivering the message, which has now been announced to you by those who preach to you the gospel through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. All right. What's he trying to say? He wants us to understand what a privileged place we have in history. Which I don't think, by and large, we keep a hold of very much. After 2,000 years, in our entire life, lived, it's the new normal. But he wants us to understand, don't, don't let that dull the vision of the truth of how gifted you are. He says great prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, David, Jeremiah, all the rest of them, as wonderful as they were and important they are to God in the plan of God, they longed to see clearly what they could only glimpse partially, which by the Spirit they prophesied about, but which did not understand totally because it wasn't explicitly revealed yet. You live in the time that, not all, but much of which they, they anticipated cryptically and partially has been explicitly revealed. And we should glory in that. He goes on, the next line was that it says, even the angels longed to catch a glimpse of these things, which you now have in your hand, which you now live out. And that we are very gifted. We are the very people they spoke about. A time would come, an, an age of the new covenant, an age where everything would be different. They didn't exactly know what that meant, but they knew it was going to be the equivalent of a creation of a whole new humanity, a whole new world, right? We now understand a lot of what that means, which they didn't. For instance, we now understand, you know, back, back in the Old Covenant, when you read the Old Testament, they didn't have a very explicit understanding, you might say, of what, of heaven or the afterlife, did they? They talked about the bosom of Abraham. In some places they talked like the only lasting legacy anybody could have was their descendants on earth. And somehow you lived on in them. You know, in, in various places it seemed to grow. And if you, we could do a study on it. I doubt if we will. But if you go through the Old Testament and you look at the slowly unveiling revelation of God about these things, it was growing in its understanding about heaven and the afterlife and judgment, the Christ who was to come. But it wasn't explicit. Nothing like we understand it now. I mean, we still have mystery. We don't know exactly what heaven is like. But compared to what these ancients had of what happens after death, it's just explosively more bright and brilliant and more detailed, right? As far as the Christ, all of us here, I, I hope none of us have any doubt, we know who this mysterious anointed one of God is. Even up to the birth of Christ, many of the rabbis had not come to an explicit understanding of what he was going to do or where he was going to come from or who he was going to be. This idea that he was going to be son of man and son of God and that he was going to bring about a whole new kingdom, a whole new people of God that had an expansive understanding beyond what they ever thought. Another very important thing we now hold is that the kingdom of God, the people of God, the salvation, this new humanity that God intended through the new birth of baptism is for everyone. It's for everyone. Well, we, we studied Acts and we realized that even the apostles at first didn't understand that. They still thought it was just for Jews. But Jeremiah talks about, you know, there will be a day come in Isaiah 2 where priests will come from other nations, 
other nations and other people will come to Jerusalem and I will make of them priests. And that, and that, and that, and that this new grace, this recreation, will be for everyone. It's there, but they, they missed it, right? They missed it. So this is something that we now hold. Uh, most of us, and Paul and, P and Peter said it too, once you were no people and now you are the people of God. Those who existed in darkness without hope or a destiny or call are now called freely to come to the table of the Lord. This is, this is things that were prophesied, which now we, we now live in and, in and enjoy the fulfillment of that prophecy. And that's what he's trying to help us to see. And it says, they were revealing even the sufferings of Christ. Can I give you just two examples of that? Let's go to... Uh, Let's go to Psalms. Just Psalm 22 is one. Now listen, traditionally Psalms is written by David, and that would be a thousand years B.C. All right, some Bible scholars would say, okay, he didn't write all these Psalms. It might have been written by people in the Davidic tradition, and it might have been a, a century or two after that. Fine. But it's still going to be 800, 900 years before Christ, all right? I'm also going to read from Isaiah. And the same thing. He's 650 years before Christ. So maybe somebody, one of his students, or a student's student wrote it 100 or 200 years after that. It's still hundreds of years before Christ. But just, just listen. This is, this is hundreds of years before Jesus Christ. Talking about the anointed one. The suffering servant, he calls. And he's talking about, I can't read the whole thing. But you'll recognize this. A psalm opens with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where do we know those words from? Jesus on the cross. Now you and I know the details of the passion of Christ. Written in the Gospels and actually crucifixion recorded in secular history by people like Josephus and others. Well, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. That was an invention of torture and death by the Romans. The Romans at this point were still hunter-gatherers in an obscure village in southern Italy. They were not the Roman Empire by far. That, that was way in the future. So I don't know what inspired, well I do know who inspired, but I don't know what people like David and Isaiah and others had in their mind when they penned these words. They didn't, I mean, but they knew that's what they were supposed to write. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of my groaning do nothing to save me. I call by day, but you do not answer. At night, I find no respite. goes on here, just uh, selecting a few. They sneer and wag their heads. He trusted himself to God. Let God set him free. Where did we hear that spoken? Today. <laughs> on the cross, those who were crucifying Christ mock him and jeer him and said, he trusted God. So God would save him. Let's see if God comes and rescues him. It's almost quoting. It's like they're seeing the crucifixion. He says, My strength is trickling away. My bones are all disjointed. My heart is turned to wax melting inside me. My mouth is dry as earthenware and my tongue sticks to my jaw. You just picture Jesus lying there saying, I thirst. I have one more thing to say. I need something to moisten my lips. Right? Right? A pack of dogs surrounds me. A gang of villains is closing in on me as if to hack off my hands and my feet. I count every one of my bones while they look on and gloat. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. My God. Uh, what detail. This is not out there where you have to stretch to make it apply. Uh, all right. I'm going to stop there. That's just because I also want to do a little bit from Isaiah. All right, let's let's go to Isaiah, the first and biggest of the prop, book of the prophets. Let's, there's a lot, but let's go to 52, where he's 52, 53, the song of the suffering servant. The end of 52. If Isaiah wrote this, this is 750 B.C. I'll give you 100 years. I'll give you 200 years. <laughs> 550 B.C., all right? Whatever. End of 52. Look, my servant will prosper, will grow great, will rise to great heights. As many people were aghast at him, he was so inhumanely 
inhumanly figured, that he no longer looked like a man. Who has given credence to what we have heard? 53. Who has seen in it a revelation of Yahweh's arm? Like a sapling, he grew up before him, like a root in arid ground. He had no form or charm to attract us, no beauty to win our hearts. He was despised, the lowest of men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, one from whom, as it were, we averted our gaze, despised, for whom we had no regard. Yet ours were the sufferings he was bearing, ours the sorrows he was carrying. While we thought of him as someone being punished and struck with affliction by God, whereas he was being wounded for our rebellions and crushed because of our guilt, the punishment reconciling us fell on him, and we have been healed by his bruises. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And Yahweh brought the acts of rebellion of all of us to bear on him. Ill-treated and afflicted, he never opened his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughterhouse. Like a sheep dumb before its shearers, he never opened his mouth. Go on and on and on. You and I know explicitly how that carried out. But what a mysterious thought to meditate on what Isaiah was thinking. What did that look like in Isaiah's mind, his vision, his imagination when he was penning those words? To us there's no mystery. But that's Peter's point. What a gifted point of view we have in so much of this, that so much of what was prophesied in the future is now a past event that we can contemplate in a reality that even they never could. He says even angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. What does that mean? We often think of angels as being like God. Well, they're very smart. But they're not omniscient. They're not God, right? They didn't know everything. They knew God had this plan. And as it unfolded through the acts of salvation history, the calling of Abraham, bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, etc., 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 they saw it unfolding. Even they knew a anointed one, a Messiah, was to come, but they wondered, what was it going to look like? When was it going to happen? Where was it going to be? They didn't know. Isn't that interesting? God didn't reveal all that to them. They don't know everything, and they're also not omnipresent. So God, yes, exists outside of time. He sees the whole scope of history from creation to the end uh, as one current event, but they don't. They're going through, they're going through time. They're learning as they went along. Much smarter than us and having a higher perspective than we do. But even they wondered, what, what is he doing? You wonder when they had a day off to just sit around thinking, let me tell you what I saw this week, you know. Yeah. That, I mean, what is he up to? This is amazing, right? You wonder. And I, and I think that uh, even Jesus' closest uh, friends and his disciples have that Emmaus walk. He had to of he had open the scriptures to them and they were then their hearts burned with them. Right. So they didn't even get the whole No, thing. even the apostles, they didn't immediately just like break open and say, Whammo, now we got it all. No, no, because they were still had a lot of stinking thinking stuck in there, right? There was a lot of the answer to the question is right in front of you. <laughs> you saw it the day before yesterday, and they're going Well Gomer probably used to say Shazam, right? <laughs> You're right. That makes perfect sense. Well, that's what happened to Paul. And that's what Paul had to teach the other apostles. And a lot of the rabbi Christians who had converted, who had such an allegiance to the old train of thought and the old interpretations of the Old Testament and the old conclusions that Paul says, no, it's bigger than that. It's not just that you're wrong. It's just that the truth swallows that up like a grain of sand and a milkshake. I mean, it's just... Just put that aside. Open your brain to what's going on. It's right in front of you. Peter said, you know, I saw the Holy Spirit descend on that group of Gentiles with Cornelius and his family when I preached to them. They had a Pentecost experience just like we did. So I baptized them. But even I at that time didn't understand what it meant. It took years. It took him listening to Paul now talking about what's going on in Asia Minor and all these Gentiles are coming in and, and being saved by droves, for him to say, Paul's right. He's right. This is bigger than we ever thought. This is for everybody. 
Even those we thought were enemies. Even those we thought the Goim, the dogs, the Gentiles, the persecutors of the church, the Romans, the Canaanites, the, all those we thought were enemies. And since they were enemies to our ancestors, they're also enemies of God. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I want all of them. All the descendants of Adam. Because here's what God is now revealing and Peter's trying to get across. When Adam and Eve were excluded from the Garden of Eden, that's a curse that fell on the whole human race. What's happened now with the recreation of the human race is that we now have access back to Eden. That's what heaven is. Right? The perfected Eden. And that between now and there, he said, we should act like pilgrims, exiles, travelers on the way home. Even though it's a place we've never been to yet, it is our homeland. That's the way he, exactly he wants, he wants us to see it. And therefore, hold everything that happens in this life, the positive and the negative, with a loose grip. Put your treasure where? Home. Park it at home where daddy can lock it away in a safe. So when you get there, it's in good shape, shiny and brand new and will always be that way. Okay. Questions? The privilege is that we, as even the least members of God's family in the new covenant, hold a status higher than the greatest saints of the old covenant. That's what Jesus said when he saw John the Baptist, remember? There's John, the greatest man born of women up to now. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's the difference. It's not a small thing. Being, a, being privileged to enter into a relationship with God through the blessings and the prerogatives of the new covenant, and especially through the rebirth of the new covenant's birth process, which is baptism, faith and baptism, allows us to not to have a standing before God that Isaiah and Jeremiah, Moses and Abraham could never even have dreamed of. We are now his beloved children. Not just his faithful servants, but his beloved children. Therefore, heaven is not just a reward for a job well done. It is our heritage. That's the exact words he used. Okay. Let's move on. I, I say that because, you know, we do, we don't live in that constant understanding, do we? The world suits it. Right. And, and I think that's what he understands is the danger. Maybe he didn't understand how di they're still living in the brilliance of this new revelation. They're the first generation Christians, right? But we now live in 2,000 years where we're used to it. Uh, it's still a process going on. The world's not yet been fully evangelized. All right, there's still plenty of that works against us. But wor what works against us the most, I think, is all those things that allow us to go dull, to lose our vision, to lose a sense of who we are, to sink back into thinking, I'm only living for that promotion. I'm only living for that 401k. Or I'm only living to get a few more years of physical health. Or I'm only living for blah, 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 blah. All earthly goals in themselves, good things, but not the best things. And if we live for good things and ignore the best things, it's not right order. And it'll get us off course. Exactly what he says. Our minds then, verse 13, must be sober and ready for action. Put all your hope in the grace brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do not allow yourselves to be shaped by the passions of your old ignorance. Put that aside. But as obedient children, not servants, not slaves, children, be yourselves holy in all your activity after the model of the Holy One who calls us, since Scripture says, be holy for I am holy. If you address Him as Father... Stop there. So what's he saying? He just used children and father. Not by accident. All right? We're children of God who now, he says, we can address rightly as father. The new birth has a father. And it's God. Right? So we are now his children. All right, so that has a couple of quick applications in that imagery, in that metaphor. We relate to him different 
than a servant or as an employee, right? For one thing. The other thing is that like all children, we're supposed to grow up and we're supposed to take on the characteristics of our Father. And he's saying, be holy as I am holy. That's God saying, grow up and be like me. Holy means sanctified. It means set aside. I told you, I think in the first or second session, the Jewish word was kadesh. And it means set aside for a special, unique purpose. The same word was used for marriage. When you are married, you are set aside for a special and unique relationship and purpose with this man or this woman that is different from your relationship with every other man or woman in the world. The same word is used. That's why the bride of Christ works when Jesus talks about the church and our relationship to Jesus Christ. Set aside for a relationship with him that is unique. And he said, be holy, be set aside, be sanctified, be different. And strive to be like your Father. Which means exactly like trying to be like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says the Father and I are one. So the more we become like Christ, we fulfill this commandment. And it is a commandment. But it also says that just because we're born again, we're not finished. Doesn't it? He's talking to Christians. They're already born again. But he's saying, be sober, be diligent, be alert, and continue to work towards becoming holy. Because you're not yet what you were birthed to be. And the metaphor of the new birth works perfectly. When a baby is born, he's fully born. But he's not yet what he was born to be. So that's that all readiness and not yetness that we talked about so often in so many studies. That is the Catholic understanding of salvation. Saved and sanctification. You can't really... We're already born, yes, through the rebirth. We're born again, absolutely. Are you going to heaven? I hope so. Because we understand we're a pilgrim people, perhaps delivered from Egypt, but I'm not to the promised land yet. And I don't take it for granted that between here and there, I can stop being sober and ready for action and being diligent. Perhaps I can get lazy. Maybe I can go back to following the ignorance of my old passions. Which is exactly what worries the pudding out of Peter. That's what he doesn't want us to do. Right? Right. These days. I'm sorry, Lord. These days. These days. Yeah. Laid back. Laid back. Yeah, being laid back, there's nothing wrong with being confident, but being laid back and lazy in our call is dangerous. Is very dangerous. All the readings this week spoke to that from uh, Revelation. Jesus said, you know, you've lost your first love. You've gotten... Exactly. All week long he was... Well, he's talking about how he's judging some of the very authentic churches that were born in enthusiasm and devotion. And how some of them have... It didn't last. He talks about the seed, right? The seed's always good. And, but a lot of places it pops up and grows... It withers because of either the weeds or lack of moisture or the sun gets too hot. Not all, not every sprout becomes a full blown stalk of wheat. All the metaphors are there. So reveling in our calling and our salvation is wonderful. Becoming satisfied and complacent about it is toxic and dangerous. That's what he says. And I think Paul says it. I think it's all throughout scriptures. Jesus says it many times. All right. If you address as father him, listen to this. If you address as father him who judges without favoritism according to each individual's deeds. Live out the time of your exile, my scripture says. Does anybody else have a different word there? Live out the time of your sojourning. Right. We've got different words, but... Not, not really a different meaning at all, right? So, living out the time of now where we're not where we're supposed to be forever. We're on our way. We're not in our homeland. We're not even immigrants because we didn't move here wanting to stay here. We're exiles. Exiled from Eden. It works, right? Right. But now, thank God, not permanently, temporarily. Right? Right? The invitation, the way back 
has been opened by Jesus Christ. And we who believe in that and have that as our hope follow Christ and his way through faith and obedience. And in the scriptures there's no difference. They call it the obedience of faith. Are the ones who will follow the path back to Eden, to heaven, to the homeland, whatever you want to look at it. For you know that the price of your ransom from the futile way of life handed down from your ancestors was paid. Now that's for Gentiles and Jews. He's writing to both. But he's saying the, the way you used to live, the value system you used to have, perhaps the way you used to worship, and what you used to believe as deity, yada, yada, yada. The way of your ancestors was futile. Ransom from that has been paid, not in anything perishable by silver or gold, not money, but in the precious blood as of a blameless and spotless lamb, Christ. Blameless and spotless lamb. So where is he trying to rivet our attention right there? Blameless and spotless lamb. Passover. Passover. I mean, there are other sheep sacrifices, yes. But the one that stands overarching all of them, I think. The blameless and spotless lamb. So the, the Jewish converts would know this, but the Christian converts had all been instructed in the Jewish scriptures. Like I said before, that was the only scriptures they had yet. The New Testament was still under construction. I'm going to read in part of it, right? So when the new converts were instructed in the, the way of Christianity, the scriptures that were opened up by their teachers, their CCD and RCIA instructors, were what we would call the Old Covenant. To them, it was called the scriptures, Okay? And so they too knew about this, but they understood it in the context of what it anticipated. That's why we don't throw the Old Covenant, the Old Testament out. We say it is very much part of a, the Christian scriptures. The Old Testament is fulfilled in the New. The New Testament is anticipated in the Old, and we can have a much fuller understanding of what the New Testament realities are if we take a look at those Old Testament prophetic prototypes. So let's talk just a second about the Passover lamb. Tell me about the Passover lamb. We're talking about uh, probably 1500 years BC I think. The Jews had now been in Egypt for 400 years. Remember Abraham sent his sons down there to find food. They ended up, not Abraham, Israel had sent his sons down there. They all moved down there for a while, they were welcomed by Joseph, one of them, who had a high rank in, in Pharaoh's court. And they were welcomed as privileged guests. And as the years went by, we got new Pharaohs. And they grew very numerous. And they became, the Egypt, Egyptians became afraid of them because their numbers were so great. So they were enslaved. They were kept in a, in a, a specific place, Goshen, kind of a region of Egypt. But they were used as slave labor to build the pharaohs, pyramids, and all those things, right? So now, 400 years of that. I'd like you to think about the, the, the state of Judaism at that point. Judaism as we know it. <laughs> they wouldn't have understood at all. I mean, what did they have at this point? Now, this is before Moses shows up and says, it's time to leave. I think, it's just, I think it's just important because this is part of the analogy he's wanting us to look at. They're about to be saved. Saved from Egypt. Right? At this people, at this point, all they understood about their identity is that somehow they were different from everyone else. Because they had a common ancestor named Abraham who somehow God liked. And, and Abraham knew. Right. So they had vague promises to Abraham's descendants that they would be a special people. How special do you think they felt so far? 400 years as slaves. All right. They have no priesthood. Not the ironic priesthood yet. They had no king. The promised land was somewhere that none of them had ever been to. 
right? <laughs> they had no laws. They didn't even have the Ten Commandments. They had no explicit covenant with them. They had nothing. They had nothing except this vague idea of, of what would become dogmatic monotheism. That there's one God out there, we don't know what his name is. But he's different from all the other gods. And he's greater than the other gods, even though we're the lowest of all the people in the world. Yeah, he loves us. And he's stronger than all these Egyptian gods, even though they've been treating us like cattle for hundreds of years. That's where they are right now. Well, Peter wants us to understand that's the condition of the human race before Christ. That's what he, We had vague notions, at least the Jews did, of something to come. And there were God-fearers, somehow, that respected the God of the Jews. But not much more than that. And the Gentiles, the barbarians, the pagans that were outside of the understanding of Judaic, Jewish monotheism, they were, they were floating out there in space somewhere so far away. I mean, they had nothing. Nothing, right? I think that's what he's wanting us to understand. And then Moses shows up and he says, the time for your deliverance is at hand. And it's specifically going to be worked tonight by a unique act of God, nothing you've done, none of your planning, none of your military organization, none of your diplomacy is going to have anything to do with it. God is going to move in Egypt in a way that's going to break the will of this stubborn Pharaoh. All right? For you to be spared from the judgment, you are to mark your homes with the blood of a lamb. Gathered together, if you're home, because they have to eat the entire lamb. By the way, the lamb had to be eaten. All right? It's going to be sacrificed, roasted, and eaten. And if your family's too small, gather with another family close to you so that there's enough of you, right? Take the blood of the lamb and with a hyssop stick, dip it in the blood and mark the doorpost of your house. Then eat the lamb and go to bed. And all the houses that are marked like this, the firstborn son will be spared. If you're not marked with the blood of the lamb, the curse on the land will fall on you. So those that did it and obeyed were, sa were saved. It would be over a thousand years before anyone would begin to understand why a lamb? Why eat it? Why none of its bones were to be broken? They had to roast it that specific way. It had to be unblemished. In other words, don't take, don't take a lamb that you can spare. Take a valuable one, unblemished one. Uh, one that did not deserve to be killed for any other reason. Sacrifice it. By the way, what they did was they split it right up the diaphragm and opened it up. Kept kept it, you know, gutted it, kept it open by putting a cross inside of it and then roasted it. So none of the bones would be broken that way. And they would be thinking, what, what weird ritualism? How, what legalistic detail? There might have been saying, some saying, this makes no sense. This, I am not going to do that. Listen, God is God. If he wants to save me, he can save me. Right? Or, or I don't want to waste one of my lambs. I'll just, I'll just step on a frog and smear him up there. Or, 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 or I don't like lamb meat. I don't like, what do you call lamb meat? I don't like, I don't like mutton, right? Is that mutton? All right. I don't like lamb chops. So we'll cook a fish, right? We'll have, we'll have a nice fish fry tonight instead. And that'll do just fine, won't it? Because God can't be that legalistic. Right? Right. It made no sense to them. We still hear that today. Especially criticism against the sacramental system. Where we specifically use stuff by God's design. And we believe that by doing this somehow in a way that's above rationality. Certainly not rational. God does miraculous things. And I think a lot of people at that time could have thought the same thing. But I submit to you, though, it's not clear. Those that put frog blood up there or who ate fish instead of lamb 
what happened the next morning did they find when they went in the bedroom of their eldest son? Surely he was dead. I'm just putting that out there. He's, he's inviting us to think about this Old Testament prototype and apply it to the New Covenant reality. So Jesus Christ, of course, the Lamb of God, identified the first words of John the Baptist, who, sa who said, I was told by God, the one that I will be the prophet that will open the door to the Messiah. That's why he's the greatest of them all. He didn't work any other miracles that we know of. But he had the lips and the eyes and the finger that said, there he is. Baptized Jesus. And he was told, the one whom I see, see the Spirit of God descending, that is him. All right, so he said, God told me this. So he sees that. He says, there he is. But he doesn't say, my cousin Jesus. Or he doesn't say, the Son of God. He doesn't say, the Messiah even. He says, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. The, the thread is connected. And now, and now as we look back through the lens of fulfillment of time, we see the genius of that, prototyp, that prototypical event anticipating what would happen later in fullness and in history, right? How we can understand more what it meant for Jesus, the Lamb of God, to offer His blood. And oh, by the way, also offer His body to be eaten for those who would put their hope in God. That this was the way God said, your deliverance is at hand. This is how it's going to be done. I've done it before in a miniaturized earthly version to help you understand. And now I'm doing it with eternal supernatural ramifications. I have a question. Please. Um, the firstborn didn't do what was told. The firstborn was dead. Was that a punishment for Egypt at that time? Or is there, does that mean something? A study of the faithless firstborns through scriptures is, is very interesting. Okay. There are very few. The firstborn son was supposed to be the privileged son who got the double portion. And, in, and before Aaron would be the priest of the family, the high priest being the father. That all changed with the golden calf thing. Yeah. But uh, so he was supposed to be the example for the rest. But, but the story of the Old Testament is a story of faithless, failed, firstborn sons. Prodigals. Prodigals. So that's part of it also. Um, Does it mean something for today? Yeah, it probably means more than I can actually put my finger on, to tell you the truth. Okay. I'm just going to be honest with you. I sense that there's something really a lot more there that delving into it would probably be even more than that. But the point was that Jesus Christ becomes the firstborn of the new family of God. He's not the firstborn naturally, but he's the first in uh, uh, standing in the family of God. I mean, naturally born, but he existed from the beginning of time. So in his godly nature, he existed before the first human being ever. So in the new family of God, he is the oldest brother, the faithful one who did advocate for his younger siblings, who did offer himself for on our behalf, who didn't fail God, who is the high priest, who fulfilled the destiny that all the others failed. Okay? So there's that too. Okay. I just want to throw a theory out. But how much falls with the firstborn or the bad firstborn? Yeah. When God created the angels before us, they were never apparently created in tears, you know, importance. Seems like Lucifer first created. Michael, second created. Then when they revolted, held the eldest. Well, yeah, I can see that. He's he, he's talking about the fall of the heavenly host of the angels, the one-third of angels who fell because they said, I will not serve in this plan of God to redeem the human race. And that the leader of the rebellion was the angel who held the highest order amongst all of creation, really, outside of the Godhead, outside of the Tr Holy Trinity, of all the created realm, he held the highest throne. He was, and he's the one that said, I will not serve. And then Michael basically became the leader of, I don't know if he was second, but he was not first. And uh, so even there, we have that pride of rank contaminating 
the ability to live up to the call except in Jesus. Right. 